Hey everybody, welcome to Word of a Woman. I'm Michelle and this is my first ever video blog. Um, I am here uh, with Phil Shepard, also known as the Whiskey Preacher, and he has been gracious enough to let me use his in-home studio today to do this interview. We just finished up doing an interview uh, where we were in the reverse roles and he was interviewing me and you'll get to see that soon here as well as on his blog. Uh, Phil, can you tell us where people can find you online? Yes, uh, you can go to a couple different places. You can go to philshepherd.com and kind of get a better feel of who I am, I guess. And then I blog at uh, on Pathios. So if you go to pathios.com and you type in Outlaw Theology, which is the name of my blog there, or Whiskey Preacher, you can find my website on Pathios. Awesome. Okay, um, today I'm going to be talking with Phil about um, chronic pain and how that affects him both personally and as a, um, and as a pastor. Uh, Phil and his wife Stephanie are um, co-founding pastors of a community here in Fort Worth called the Eucatastrophe. Um, I believe you can find them at the uke.com. That's T H E E U C dot com. So there's two E's in there. There you go. T H E E U C dot com. And uh, we found each other um, through the internet, oddly enough. Uh, actually, my blog, after I started it, I became friends with Kathy Escobar, who is up in Colorado and is also a fellow blogger and church planter and co-pastor um, of a community up there called The Refuge. And she was friends with Phil, and the rest, as they say, is history. We are in the same metropolitan area, which has been really cool for our communities. Um, just knowing there's another group out there doing what you're doing, and... Um, there's crazy yeah, there's just, you yeah, <laughs> our, 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 To have somebody in it with you is always, yeah. um, is always comforting, just to know you have community and somebody else who can say, Oh yeah, me too. Um, is really cool. So uh, I guess my first question for you, Phil, is: Have you always lived with chronic pain? You know, no, I, I haven't always lived with chronic pain. I only recently was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called fibromyalgia. Autoimmune diseases run in my family. My mother is plagued with rheumatoid arthritis, which is a nasty, nasty autoimmune disease that um, affects and disfigures your joints and limits your mobility. And, and I also have a brother that is, suffers from that as well. And then, of course, I have another brother who is fighting a completely different other autoimmune disease called Graves' disease. Um, and so I went to a rheumatologist to be tested for lupus, to be tested for rheumatoid arthritis, and her other specialty happens to be fibromyalgia. And thank God I was I tested negative for lupus and rheumatoid, but she told me I had a very severe case of fibromyalgia, which is unique because I found out in only the handful of months that I've known that I've had this disease that it's mostly found in women, and that I'm pretty sure I'm the only male patient that my doctor has. And what the disease does is it, um, it has me in constant pain all the time. My body never rests, so when I go to sleep at night, my body is always tensed up, and it hurts all the time. I... You know, I look like I should be able to lift a sack of potatoes like it's nothing. You know, I'm six foot, 275, but it's a faceless disease. My body won't allow me to do that anymore. I, with chronic pain, it also comes with chronic exhaustion and fatigue. I've literally been standing one moment and then can't walk the next. I remember just a handful of weeks ago at one of the worship gatherings at the youth, I was fine the entire time, and we had about 10 minutes left, and my body gave up. And, um, 
it's just been difficult to try to figure out what this looks like in life. You know, I, I've always been in the in battle of workaholism. Um, I've always had, I felt like a strong work ethic, but, but I don't condone being a workaholic. I, <laughs> and having fibromyalgia and being a workaholic don't jive together very well. And so my, as my doctor told me on the day of my diagnosis, that the world that I knew no longer exists. And my world has been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. I guess my next question then would be as a, as a pastor and um, a speaker and a blogger, I mean, you're, you, you kind of have uh, your, you know, you know, wear a lot of hats, you know, yeah. a lot of irons in the fire, whatever, whatever uh, phrase kind you like to use for that, you place, know, you, yeah. you have a lot of different interests and a lot of different um, forms that your, your ministry takes. And I'm wondering how this diagnosis, at least so far, I mean, I know it's new, so a lot of that is still, you're still figuring that out for yourself, uh, much less being able to tell me, so I understand that you may not be able to give me a full answer, but how do you feel like this has changed or is changing um, those many roles that you've had? I've had to learn, and I'm learning to prioritize. I have always had a tendency to, like you said, have a lot of irons in the fire, and you know, being a church planner, you, especially doing churches like we do, you've got to find some um, ways to continue to create and feed your imagination, and so I've been very fortunate to have a community that has commissioned me to go out and be, as they lovely call me, their mascot for the catastrophe. Um, That's awesome. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to necessarily do with that right now, but the, yes, they call me their, the Uke's mascot, and, uh, and so I've been able over the last handful of years to, you know, do some speaking at some conferences, do some blogging uh, professionally, and they just allowed me and, and, and pushed me to go do that. With all that saying, having, you know, plus a lot of local interests in the Fort Worth community here, I've had just to prioritize. I've had to, um, you know, my physical therapist told me this, you used to do 10 things a day, now you can do 10 things a week. And you've got to figure out what those 10 things are. And that for somebody like me, that's a hard and bitter pill to swallow. And so I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning to prioritize. I'm learning to um, figure out what are the things that I want to focus on. I've been writing recently a lot about what does it mean to have chronic pain? What does it mean to minister? with chronic pain and exhaustion and all that stuff. And it's opened a whole new world for me. Because a lot of people I've found that, especially with a lot of the recent debates about self-assisted suicide and sure. all of these other things, a lot of people are talking and writing about what does it mean to have chronic pain right before death, but nobody's really talking about what does yeah, it mean well, to have chronic pain and live? Right, and 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 you know, like recently in Colorado, you know, in medical marijuana and things like that. I mean, yeah. for people with chronic pain, and I know uh, fibromyalgia, just different things. I know that's an. I mean, there's a lot of uh, hot button topics yeah. to then be dealt with. So, on on the one hand, you know, it it's um, obviously very uh, unfortunate situation to find yourself in, for lack of a stronger and better term um, but on the on the other hand it gives you an opportunity because of the platform that you have to give a face to a faceless disease as you say or many faceless diseases because I know my grandmother had lupus and it you know you look fun you know you look fine on the outside and you may not know this but we've had many takes and in a previous take <laughs> 
I'm going to reference that. Yes, I am. Phil said something about um, as he's sitting here being in pain yep. and feeling um, feeling intense pain while he's sitting here talking to me, which may not be something that you all are aware of or can perceive. And it's, I think, an important and, and actually uh, maybe the most positive thing uh, fr from just an outside perspective of, of knowing somebody in your position is for you to be able to shed light for me on what it's like and how I can better love people in my life who maybe I don't even know at this point have conditions such as fibromyalgia, lupus, um, obviously rheumatoid arthritis you can be often you can see a little bit more um, depending on the stage you know the advancement of it but there's several um, of these types of diseases where you you look fine you know what I mean no one would know to look at you if they walk by you in Starbucks yeah. they aren't gonna go oh that guy looks like he's in pain maybe yeah. I could do something for him that would bless it you know nobody's you know people are not you know you look as healthy as I do sitting here yes um, I guess then that, that feeds right into the next question that I had, which was how has living with chronic pain and, and something that is not changed the way that people treat people who know, um, or even people who, who maybe don't know and then are made aware, do you, you know, do you get a lot of, well, you look fine, or, you know, yeah. or has it, has, how has it changed the way people you know uh, either intimately or not so intimately, how has it changed the way that they relate to you? I mean, I've had responses as well, varied as it's just in your head, get over it. Um, fibromyalgia is not a real disease. You know, it's only recently, uh, in the last couple of years, been actually categorized because there's still so much not known about it. Sure. Um, as an, an official autoimmune disease. Um, so, not only am I been diagnosed with a disease that there's not a lot known about it, but I'm one of the few males that has it as well. And so, uh, you know, I've had, yeah, like I said, you know, it's just in your head, get over it, to... Um, you know, when I told my mother, I waited a couple months before I told my mother uh, just because I wanted to understand it a little bit more. She was devastated. Sure. You know, uh, because I was, out of her children, my oldest brother and I'm the youngest, we were the only ones that didn't have an autoimmune disease. And so she automatically feels like you know, it's her bad genes that gave mm. it to all of us. Yeah, that's tough. Um, so, some people um, are very supportive. I've got, there's a woman who is a part of the UK, uh, who's the one who really pushed me to get tested for it in the first place. She has been living um, She's been living with fibromyalgia for the last 14 years. She's a mom, she's a wife, she's an integral part of our community at the Eucatastrophe. She was one of their original seven. If you go to my, my blog, you can see she did a guest post for me a couple of weeks ago because when I found out that I had fibromyalgia, I told her, well, I'm not, I don't back down. That's just not my personality. I, I'm an Enneagram 8, if that makes sense to anybody in your audience. Uh, so I'm the, the challenger, and I, I wanted to take this head on and, and talk about it. And in the midst of that, for the first time in 14 years, she's become public about her battle with fibromyalgia, and which is awesome to me. Yeah. I mean, she finally feels like she can't, she doesn't have to live in hiding anymore. Because yeah. a lot of people, you know, in in our society, if 
it doesn't physically look like there's something wrong with you, people want to dismiss that. You know, when they see me, when my body gives out and I'm in, you know, Target or Walmart or wherever, and I have to ride in one of those damn carts that I hate, people look at you weird. People look at you differently. You know, sure. when I have to board a plane earlier um, uh, with, the, you know, the folks in the wheelchairs and stuff like that, it's, it's pretty humbling. Sure. But fortunately, Stephanie, who is my partner in life and helps start the uke with me, and she rides my ass a lot to be able to acknowledge my limitations and to be able to live into those and to be healthy with that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, I guess then my, my next question is sort of it's like a two-part question. How do you feel that um, living with crime, how has it made you more, um, more compassionate for people? And also, has, do you feel like, I mean, the flip side of that is, has it made you less compassionate for people? Like, you know, people who maybe are not really suffering something and you're like, dude, suck it up. That's all you're having to deal with? <laughs> are you serious? I'm like in raging pain right now and you're complaining because you're having to wait an extra five minutes in line for, you know what I mean? Do you, are, do you feel like it's made you, yeah, how do you feel like it's made you more compassionate and how do you feel like it's made you less compassionate? That's a good question. Um, I, I guess seeing my mother, uh, you know, who's been a huge influence in my life and and my father, who passed away in '09, that seeing her battle with this and going from you know being allergic to the first medication they gave her and gave her sores all the way from her lips to her stomach, mm. and um, and seeing her battle with that, I feel like a majority of my compassion was already there and I don't even that's that sounds kind of arrogant I think um, understanding what folks are going through at least to a certain degree and being open to where they're at in life um, has has always not always been there but it's been developed over the last probably 10 years watching my mom and knowing you know, I've had a, a few other friends that have fibromyalgia and, and watched the, their battle with it. Um, it is, I don't know if it's made me more compassionate, uh, but it has made me even more aware than I was. Sure, maybe that it's more, that, that there's more of it out there than you maybe even realized. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't think it's made me less compassionate for people because I, I think we all have a tendency to bitch, <laughs> uh, you know, about stupid things. And, and I'm just as guilty of that as anybody. So I don't know if it's made me less compassionate to people. Oh, that's good. Uh, it's made me on the defense probably more, um, especially when people are less compassionate towards me or to somebody else who has it. Mm. That's good. Um, okay, let's see. My, okay, my next one is how do you feel like this has changed your, or has it changed your, um, your take on the goodness of God? You know, you know uh, sure. how it relates to, you know, um, how, or how do you reconcile maybe pain and chronic pain in particular um, you know, as opposed to like, oh, I had surgery yeah. and I'm going to recover and then I'm going to be back to at least somewhat what I was. You know, chronic pain is a different thing. And how, how have you wrestled with that in relationship to the goodness of God? Yeah, I, that's another great question. You know, people, again, have been writing a lot about, you know, what does it theologically mean? to do assisted suicide what is it you know 
chronic pain at the end of life, but nobody is, again, writing or talking about in relationship to God about living with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And I recently had the opportunity to speak at Wright Divinity School at their chapel, and I made the comment that I don't think that this is a punishment. I don't think this is how God works. Uh, I am people who believe uh, that it's a punishment for something. Uh, I really, can I say bullshit? Yes, absolutely, yes. Um, I think it's bullshit that people buy into that because I I think a lot of our theology uh, says that because we're experiencing something that was God's will and that we're either it's been happened for the greater good of the glory of God I've been told that to you're paying for a sin and I don't believe any of that I think that is is like I said bullshit I just that is just bad theology I fully embrace that in scripture in the Genesis narrative it says that we were not only made a good creation but a really good creation Amen. and God never recanted that somewhere down the road you know, people have bought into the idea of the fall and I, I don't believe that I don't believe in original sin I believe that I'm not saying something didn't happen in the garden that altered our relationship with God, but I don't believe in this idea of the fall. Right, the, the doctrine that has become the fall yeah, and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and original sin as a specific doctrine. I know there's a lot attached to that, and, yeah. and a lot of people think have different thoughts about, about that. And um, that might be something that if you're not really familiar, a lot of us hear these kinds of phrases at church or we've grown up with some of that and like I didn't realize growing up with those particular phrases all of the doctrine and dogma that is attached to those two specific it's just um, four words you know right it's the fall and original sin right yeah. it's that there's a lot wrapped up in that doctrinally and theologically through church history and it's something that's been very interesting for me to look into so maybe you all would like to that's just a bonus okay. my last um, big question like I said is what do you what's the one big takeaway that you want people to have that you want people to know that maybe they didn't come to this interview understanding about um, living with chronic pain what's the one thing you would tell people you never know somebody's story until you invest into it. So, and what I mean by that is that life is more than just a Facebook picture. Now, I love Facebook. I'm a huge Facebooker, Twitter. I love social media. But you have to it takes time to invest into somebody's story because and if you don't invest into somebody's story you don't know what they're dealing with mm -hmm. but our culture especially our church culture you know we're in the buckle of the bible belt so church culture is huge here mm -hmm. and you know one of the first questions people ask you is is well, where do you go to church? Well, anywhere else in the U.S. that would be offensive. You know, that you don't know this person well enough to ask. That's a very personal question. But that's the first question when you meet somebody here, they ask you. And so we are, we have been trained to give short snippet answers. So the only thing that we invest into somebody's life is, is a short answer, a Facebook picture, whatnot. We don't know their actual story and to what they're dealing with. And that is important, I, I, I think. 
And it challenges us who are within the church culture to shed this one answer uh, or this one snippet question and this one answer to uh, actually because that, that becomes very lazy you know sure. and uh, investing in the people challenges our laziness because it takes effort to be in relationship with people sure and I, I wasn't going to go off on that diatribe, but I think that that's huge because, you know, people who actually know me know the, the sufferings that I go through every day, sure. and vice versa. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and we all have limited, you have 24 hours in a day just like everybody else, yeah. seven days in a week, and you have your spouse, and for me, I have kids, and you have the people who are closest to you, and you have... You know, you have these concentric circles going out, and you you can only know so many people intimately. And I think because of social media, we talked about earlier, making our world bigger and smaller in that it brings people closer together who might be far away. Um, it also expands things to the point where you know so many more people than you could have ever possibly known prior you know pre-internet for those of us who <laughs> are older than the internet which would be both phil and i yes um there were only so many people that you yeah. could know and invest in um prior to our digital age which for somebody like me is fascinating and amazing and i love being able to be connected with more people yeah um i love that so do but I. it also stretches us sometimes in ways where you feel like you can't know you can't be as involved as you wish you could be or or we again have to learn a new language right. how, how do you learn to be intimate in 140 characters how do you learn like to that. be intimate on a facebook post you know some people have accused me of being too brutally honest and open in social media however I think that that is needed oh I absolutely agree with you so in, in, instead of blaming the anti-intimacy within the social media this is what I wanted again a tangent that I wasn't planning going on but I love those we <laughs> we and we've done a lot of them today yes we have we have got to learn a new language and be willing to do that. I remember uh, I got in an argument with another minister who we were in some type of small group and we the conversation got spawned to should, if somebody dies, should somebody keep their Facebook page? And he went on this diatribe and how he thought that that was very lazy and very um, anti-norm and that it disrespectful and we should take their Facebook pages down and then he went on and how you know Twitter has made a generation of people who are lazy because they only communicate in 140 characters and I first told him that my father does not have a tombstone and Facebook has become his virtual, his Facebook page has become his virtual memorial. Right, and people can go on and they remember something yeah. or, or share it with people who would, would see, I, I totally embrace that, I love that. And then I said, you know, this is also, 140 characters is, you know, you have to learn a new language. And if you use them right, they can be very powerful. 140 characters and, can and, be very and, powerful. And before that, it was instant message. You know, some of the folks may yeah. not even remember instant message, yeah. but that was pre-Twitter, pre-Facebook. Yeah. And, and it was going to end the world before Facebook ended the world, before Twitter ended the world, before the internet ended the world, before televisions ended the, ended the world, before Elvis ruined everything. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, again you've got to continue as we continue to evolve our understanding of one another we also have to are constantly 
are having to learn new ways to communicate, new ways to be intimate, what new ways to find and learn each other's stories. And I think that okay. can happen. Oh, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, okay, moving on to, this is, this is something that I wanted to do because many of you may not be familiar with Phil. I know a lot of you in my audience probably are, um, but many of you may not be. And so I thought we would ask some fun questions. <laughs> um, like, Phil has a lot of tattoos, and <laughs> I have no tattoos, which so I find them fascinating. And um, so I want to know what is your next tattoo, if but, you have it picked out already. That's been an interesting. I mean, looping back to the chronic pain, that's one of the first triggers I realized that something was wrong. Is just because I I got one for the first time three years and it hurt like hell like I have literally been in the tattoo chair the longest session I ever did in a 48 hour period I was just shy of 20 hours holy cow and you know that was just okay I mean when I was in seminary I would bring my homework and Brian would be working on my arm and I take naps sometimes I you know whatever so I don't know I'm, I recently had another uh, mentor just pass away he had this amazing painting uh, in his office of these doves and it's actually was in the original version of the I think the New Living Translation and in memorial to him I want to get it on my neck all this is, has to do with my father passing, I've got a space for when my mom passes, but I want to put back here that, that painting and, mm -hmm. and memory of him. And then I'm always thinking of new stuff. I want to get um, a chess piece that uh, has three sparrows, which is a very common in the tattoo world. Um, the sparrow is it goes back uh, to when Navy guys were getting tattoos all the time. But I wanted to be holding a banner uh, that says Embrace Beauty because at the end of every worship gathering at the youth, that's the last thing we say is love the creator, love the creation, embrace beauty. Well that. We have something on our website at Notas that says uh, we have all truth is God's truth and we also have all uh, all beauty is God's beauty. Yeah. So I, I, I love it. I like that. That's great. Um, I, okay, here's another one. I know that you're uh, on the gluten-free, either willingly or unwillingly, or having it foisted upon you, but what is the one food that if you could add it back in without any cons any any <laughs> any penalty, that you could add it back in and be able to eat that along with your gluten? What's the one thing you would add back in? Well, it's not even personal. I had lap band surgery uh, three or four years ago. I'm a large man now, but I was a really large. I was 450 pounds, so I've lost over 150 pounds. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. And, but <laughs> it, it limits my uh, carbohydrate intake, and I can't drink anything fizzy. Mm. And I miss beer, and that uh, was a food for me. Yeah. So I may be the whiskey preacher, and I love good whiskey, uh, but I really miss So if you could Guinness. add the beer back in. Specifically would, Guinness. That would be it. Awesome. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I could see that. I could see that. Um, and let's see. Um, if you were not the whiskey preacher, uh -huh. you were not a pet, what would you, what, what's the thing that like maybe when you were a kid or, or that, you know, like if you could, you know, move, you know, rock stuff, you know, whatever, what, what's the thing that you would be doing or that you would want to be doing if you weren't doing what you do? I, uh, yeah, if I could, if I could sing, I would be a professional musician that yeah. is my love I'm the only one out of my brothers who can't sing and I uh, I hate it because music is so much a part of my life yeah. good music is so much a part of my life you're going to Mumford and Sons and mm. I'm really kind of jealous and pissed off that yeah. you get to go and I wish I had, I wish I had known maybe we could have worked something out but um I guess my last, uh, I, well, no, I have, I have two more. Okay. I like um, the fun questions. Yeah. Uh, one more, three more. This okay. one's easy. Last meal. Maybe it's not easy. 
That's a tough one for me. With or without the lap man? Oh, without. I mean, this is, oh. you're going to die. This is the last oh, thing you're going to wow. eat. You will have no repercussions. Um, no limitations on, on what you can eat. Either Guido's Pizza from Anchorage, Alaska, or mm. Milano's Pizza from Anchorage, Alaska. I, with a Guinness. With a Guinness. <laughs> and probably some of my mom's uh, peach cobbler. Mm. With some ice cream on top. Oh god, that would be amazing. There we go. That's good. That's a good one. Oh, and then hungry. three things you can't do without. Stephanie. Of course. Is she always next mental note for the next interview? Always exempt the spouse from that question. <laughs> <laughs> um. Internet. Mm. And, and probably my dogs. Hmm. Yeah, uh, we have that. three, three amazing dogs, two bull mm -hmm. mastiffs and one and uh, one English bulldog. So, awesome. Well, that's all I've got, and it's been awesome sharing this interview with Phil and with you guys. And who knows, maybe there will be another one uh, sometime in the future. Maybe I'll do this again if you guys like it. So, thanks let for having me. Know. me. Hi. Oh, be sure to leave comments and go see Phil on Patheos or on Facebook or Twitter at uh, Whiskey Preacher. Nope. No. At, at Phil Shepard. I Phil actually Shepherd. got on Twitter in the very beginning and had actually had my name as my Twitter handle. There you go. And you can also visit philshepherd.com. Uh, check me out there. Hashtag Whiskey Preacher. If you do go do this on Twitter, have this conversation. Awesome. Um, you can go to Facebook. And I have a Whiskey Preacher page there, too. So thank awesome. you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me use all your equipment and stuff. Bye, everybody. Bye.